Now, Pat Quigley, you're a Castle Berman. I am indeed, and brave to be in Westport. Uh, no, I know, we're, we're blowing so we, have, we don't hold these kind of grudges. <laughs> what was it like in Castlebar in your youth? Well, I, I lived actually in uh, Ballyhane, which is about five miles outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course we used to, went to school, we cycled to school, cycled home, and um, did a few exams, did reasonably well, and some places not too well, but that's the way it goes. So you went to primary school in Ballyhane? That's right, yeah. And who were the teachers there at the time? Uh, there was a Mr. Cannon, Mr. Cannon. who spoke, who taught everything through Irish. Was it a one man school or a uh, teacher two, school? Two, two persons. Two, yeah. Who was the second teacher then? Um, his mother. Oh, yeah. And then you went to secondary school? Uh, into Castlebar, went to the vocational college, actually. Hmm. Travelling? Exactly. Who did you work for first? Um, well, I worked for uh, a gentleman in Clamars called Creighton's. Uh, Willie Creighton was his name. Um, his brother would be more famous than Willie. It was Andy Creighton. Um, and uh, his brother John, uh, who was a turf accountant, and uh, his daughter now is um, Lucinda Creighton, I think, which everybody uh, would know fairly well. And um, politician. Yes, yeah, she's the politician. Thank and you. Um, went from that to a company called Thompsons of Cork, which was a confectionery uh, outlet. And when you were a rep, did you learn the business on the road, or did you train? Well, we trained, I suppose, um, when I worked for Creighton's, I used to sell and deliver um, ice cream and bread and confectionery. And then, as I say, I went on to Thompson's of Cork. And then I got a job with uh, GSK, which is GlaxoSmithKline. And um, my job was to convert all the maternity hospitals over to a product called Ostermilk, which was the, the food for babies. and. Uh, Thankfully, I can say with the support I got um, from all the different maternity units, I think I had converted over 90% of the hospitals in my own area, which went from Clare to Donegal over as far as Westmead. And did it take you long to do that? Um, I was with the food side for two or three years, and then my boss came to me and said, we have the ideal job for you. We want you to become a medical rep. And I said, no, no, no. Why? Um, well, I felt I wasn't uh, educated enough. I knew nothing about medicine or anything like that. And they said, don't worry, we'll train you. So I started anyway, and I um, started with a gentleman called Des Griffith, who was before me. So he showed me um, the calls. And you might be surprised to know this, Sally. But you and Bert Farrell were the two first people that I ever called to. And you can add the last bit now as well. <laughs> <laughs> and they were the two most difficult people I ever spoke to. And I remember coming out to the car and I says, Des Griffith, I can't do this. And he says, I put you into the two most difficult calls uh, that you'll ever go into. And um, what made it difficult? Uh, because I couldn't get you to talk. You could talk. You would talk. But uh, Dr. Burt wouldn't talk. I remember leaning against the radiator with his hands behind him and his head down. Uh, I don't know, was he Were they testing more afraid? me, think? Pardon? Were they testing me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who was testing who. But anyway, um, I'd say that was the, uh, a tough morning's experience. Uh, but I went on from that and thankfully I got a good relationship with your good self and indeed Bert and so many other doctors. Uh, around the whole west of Ireland, who were extremely supportive of me over the years. Well, we drank lots of tea. Exactly. We <laughs> always, we always. I remember when I called into you, you'd say, "Go in and put on the kettle," <laughs> and uh, you know that was the breaking of the ice. People often said to me, "How do, how well do you think you get on with doctors?" And I said, "It depends on how many cups of tea you get in any day." So, so I always you were poisoned, were you? Poisoned, <laughs> poisoned, <laughs> poisoned, poisoned, poisoned. Was it an interesting job? It was. It was interesting because of all the different um, types of doctors that you met. Mm. And uh, I think over the years, um, doctors trusted me. And often you'd hear the little problems that the doctors had themselves, you know, as maybe regards their own business. But they knew that once they, you told them, or they told you, that they knew it wouldn't go any further. 
Mm. I suppose the biggest mistake I ever made was didn't have a little book and write down all the little things that happened throughout uh, my nearly 40 years on the road. Well, we all regret that. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm sure we you do. regret that. So, um, you, do, you got into sport? Did you I, play sport? Uh, no, not really. Not a lot. I played a bit of handball all right. I was never any good at football, so I got into the administration side mm. and uh, got involved with a team in Castlebar called Road Rangers. Most of them lads came from McHale Road and they were probably one of the better, better footballers in the town at the time. And of course there was always keen rivalry with Castlebar Celtic and Westport United and that. And uh, I remember I put up a cup called the Quigley Cup, which was for under 18s. And it's the longest cup that's in, um, or being played for uh, at this time. It's well over in the region of 40 years right. um, there at the moment. So it's a competition that all clubs like to win. And it always creates good football as well. So you're trying to be administration level? Yeah, I went on to the Mayo League and then on to the Connacht Football Association. And then there was a gentleman in Westport called Don McBride. And Don was the senior representative from Connacht um, to um, the Football Association. Now, Don's problem was he was on the road, but he couldn't get the time off to go. So we were trying to get somebody to go to uh, Dublin on senior council. And I was um, asked to go because at the time I had a company car and it was the best car uh, around. So they knew I'd be able to get up and down. So. That's approximately 39 years ago now. So I've been on senior council and the executive of the FAI for um, council for nearly 39 years and about 30 years on the executive. And what roles did you have in it? Well, I was the chairman of the youth committee. Uh, I also was extremely lucky to become president of the Football Association of Ireland from 1996 to 2001. I was um, chairman of the UEFA Youth and Amateur uh, Committee um, in charge of in the region of 50 countries from all over Europe. Um, since that I have been appointed as uh, a de delegate by UEFA and FIFA to go to Champions League matches, Euro Europa League matches and qualifying matches for the World Cup to act as delegate on behalf of FIFA and UEFA and you're in complete charge of all the operations uh, that take place from security to medical to making sure that the players are wearing the jersey with only the advertising that they're supposed to wear and um, all the facilities and particularly security. This but was a huge uh, achievement. A, hu a, huge, a huge achievement for, for, a, for a fellow from Ballyane stroke Castlebar. And what do, you, what do you think you had that and you able to do that? I, I, I think that um, I was able to listen. Um, um, I think I was able to tell people in a reasonably nice way if they had any problems um, in, the, in the grounds for UEFA and FIFA and, and get them to correct them before the match started. And um, I, I think the other thing was uh, getting on very, very well with all the different clubs in Mayo and along with my fellow council members uh, in Dublin mm -hmm. and I think um, above all I think honesty and showing fair play to everybody. Were well, there much politics in it? Maybe. There's always politics in sport uh, unfortunately. At the upper uh, level now? Eh? Yes, upper yeah. level, lower level, middle level, there's always a little bit of it. People are always I suppose trying to get a step further and yeah. some people will try no matter what happens uh, to get that step further but I've been extremely lucky. And you were there for five years? As I president. Was president for five years. Was that the duration of a presidency no, no. or were you elected annually? Um, I was elected for two years first with an extension. Sorry, um, I, I took over from the night of the Long Knives where we had a little bit of politics mm. uh, involved and I took over from the late Louis Kilcoyne. I served the rest of his uh, presidentship, which was a year and a half, and then I was appointed for four years uh, to act as president as well. So that was a total of actually five and a half years. I think I've been the longest president uh, ever uh, in the Football Association and the first Connacht man as well. There has been fierce controversy within the uh, FAI over the years about managers and about money and about this, that and the other and uh, 
I suppose it's part of clubs, is it? It's, it's part of, um, I suppose, <coughs> clubs and associations and things like that. You never get 100% uh, agreement, you know, you may talk about Trapatoni, some people like him, some people don't. Um, a lot of people are concerned with the, the fees that he gets, but that's what was agreed uh, at, at the time, and I suppose we had to honour that. Um, and there was money around that time? There was money around that time, exactly, mm. exactly. But mm. unfortunately there isn't now. And, and that was the price of the job? That was the price of the job, I think, as, as far as he was concerned. What do you think of journalists uh, and their assessments, and their assessments? They, yeah, like, well, they, they seem they to they be can, able to win they, every match. They can be very hard and they can be very, very cruel. And what disappoints me, there always are, in many cases, tend to show the negative aspect of the game. We never hear the, the positives as much uh, as we should. And, and at times, they're very, very critical of our players and our, of the FAI. And I suppose one could turn it back on themselves and be very critical of them as well. But that's, that's their job. They know nobody ever reads good news. They only want to read bad news. I think we don't do too badly for a small little country. With I think we've done excellent. With numerous games in it. Yeah, I mean, when you think of Germany, um, where we played our first European Championships, or World Cup, was it? And, um, you know, we've been very successful. Our fans are great. Mm. You know, they go to, even though we weren't very, well, we weren't successful at all in, in Poland this year, but they still, they went and they enjoyed themselves. They had a few drinks, they sang the songs, and they mix with the crowd and they put Ireland um, on the map for, for that particular uh, aspect. And I think when we were in Italy, people were um, so amazed at the friendliness of the Irish fans. And I think in a roundabout way, we brought a lot of Italians and Germans back into this country because they could see that uh, there were people that liked to have a drink, liked to have a sing song and enjoy themselves. If a fan gets into trouble, do you try to help them? Well, we, in many cases, thankfully, I suppose, we, if it depends on the question or what you mean by when they get into trouble. I suppose it depends on the trouble. It, it depends on the trouble. But, mm -hmm. you know, we will always uh, try and sort everything out. If it's too serious, well, maybe the, 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 the law of the country might have to take over or something like that. But, thankfully, you know, very, very few of our fans ever get into trouble. Um, we have had uh, situations where, unfortunately, um, some of our fans have had accidents in um, foreign countries and definitely at that stage we do everything in our power to help and to get their family uh, over to them or to make arrangements for, for if they have to be flown home or if, unfortunately, uh, they pass away in another country. We do everything in our power to help the family in a, in a very distressful situation. How oh, is the state of soccer in Mayo? The state of soccer in Mayo, I think, is improving slowly but surely. There's a lot of competition out there. There's the GA, there's the rugby, and there's so many things for children nowadays. Um, um, and but we're working very hard at the underage football, and um, particularly, I suppose, from 18 down, and then the juniors more or less take care of themselves. Um, our new season is just about to start. We're 20 years now in summer soccer, we started that. Uh, the Electricity League followed us, and um, I think we've been very successful on that. We are disappointed that some of the other junior clubs throughout the um, country haven't gone over to uh, summer soccer. Um, a lot of them feel they're afraid to try it, they feel that it mightn't be successful, but we could definitely say it's been suc very successful for us and playing on um, good grounds um, and you know particularly the younger children are not playing on very bad pitches or in bad weather and so on and so forth. But as regards the facilities in Mayo for our players, uh, they have improved immensely. All the clubs have, we've set a certain standard in the Mayo League and with that um, the clubs have improved immensely. Will Westport achieve their dream of a new ground? And well, I hope they do. I was, I was there for the cutting of the sod. Uh, it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard to get a lot of money, but I think there's a good group behind them. And Westport, which is probably the strongest uh, soccer area in Mayo, huge support always for every one of their matches uh, that they go to. 
um, or that they're playing in. And I, I think that with the people that's behind them at the moment, that they will achieve uh, what they want to achieve. And, and that's very important. I'd say you were, I'd say they'll be okay because Westport are great for raising funds. Sorry? Westport is a great town for raising funds. Absolutely, absolutely. The swimming pools, sailing clubs, yeah. golf clubs, you yeah. name it, the money is raised. It's, it is there and uh, they have the support in, in, um, in um, Mayo to uh, achieve what they want to achieve and particularly uh, the people of Westport will back them. And a final question, are we going to qualify for the World Cup? I'd love to say yes, but I think it's going to be extremely difficult. We have Germany, you know, we need the results to go with us. We were unfortunately against uh, Austria. We need to, to win every game. But if we play good football, and even if we're beaten in the end, the Irish fans will accept that. But they, they like to see the team moving ahead. They like to see them attacking and, of course, scoring goals. But I think there's a lot of young players coming up now. If they're given the opportunity to play for the country, we mightn't qualify for the World Cup, but we think we would definitely qualify for the European Championships uh, in two years' time, three years' time.